And now I laugh at myself, laughing at myself. Like what a joke that I couldn't um, be ego enough to be okay with the feminine energy piece. This kind of like... Kelsey Ramsden, welcome to The Better Podcast. I'm just tickled to have you here today. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy to be here. In the in the real world at the moment, it's very sunny, which is rare in the winter. So I'm it stoked is. about that. Yeah, it's, it's like be- double win. You I- and the sun. Here we are. <laughs> I bring the moon energy and then the sun is there as well. So now we have both celestial bodies uh, uh, blessing this conversation. So I'm really excited. <laughs> so we had, so I wanted to give the listeners who I call my Bettys. So the podcast okay. is better. Our fans are the Bettys. So the Bettys, um, just to give you some context, you had sent out an email saying, Hey, everyone, guess what? I'm part of this new company. Um, and it's psych- psychedelic based therapy. And I was like, Oh, we got to talks because that <laughs> is a really big interest for me, particularly with, um, as, as a type a personality who has leaned very heavily on her masculine to achieve things and to get mm-hmm. through certain traumas in my own life. Um, I think for a lot of women who are listening, I, I have, I have garnished a huge interest in psychedelics as a proxy to move towards my feminine, to do, to, to have less doing and more being. And when you emailed, I was like, okay, we got to, we have to have you on. We're going to have a nice, nice discussion around psychedelic therapy, what it can do, all the science and stuff. But I also think it's useful to have a practical application for the women and the men and all the, you know, and everything in between, you know, every, you know, for people who are looking to heal. Um, I have, off, I've said on the podcast before that uh, the first couple of times I did uh, MDMA, it was like 12 years of therapy in like concentrated into six hours. It was a lot of hard work, but on the other end of it, I was like, damn, I can see, I can see where I've been going wrong. I can see where I've been, you know, stuck in these stories and stuck in these paradigms. So yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm all that to say, all that preamble to say, I can't wait for us to chat. So welcome to the podcast. And maybe it might be, it might be useful for us to start with your experience, your origin story or, or your experience with psychedelics, how you came to this line of work. Cause everyone knows you as this like super successful entrepreneur as a female, someone like I've looked up to you in terms of the accolades and the successes that you have achieved. So I'd love for you to explain to the Bettys who you are and how you came to this line of work. I love that they're Bettys. My, my grandmother was Betty and I tried to name our daughter, Betty. I got shut down, but Betty is, um, hello, Bettys. I love hello, Bettys. Bettys. <laughs> uh, so my, my story is really one of, um, and just tying a bit into you speaking about masculine energy, I came up through a world of always having aspirations in business and then eventually starting a construction company, having grown up in a construction family. So by construction, I mean roads, bridges, dams, airports, sometimes 400 acre neighborhoods. Um, So, you know, owning your own construction business at the age of 26 as a girl, right? you know, you, you, you do a little bit of broadening your shoulders and pushing your chest out and being, you know, you kind of man up a little bit, at least I did Mm -hmm. to feel, um, you know, feel a bit of belonging in that space. I, I always relied heavily on my masculine energy and ability to really drop into that form of power. That's how I always accessed power in the origin days. And, um, you know, it did me well. Uh, to until it didn't. And when it didn't, I started to really feel this sense of, um, you know, with three children, I'd had cancer, I was struggling with like, I did all the things I jumped all the hoops, I got all the tickets. And here I am still feeling like disconnected from myself, um, feeling a little bit like I was putting on a, a bit of a show a shroud for this whole masculine power thing. And, um, and so I, I kind of, I had to take pause and go, where is it that I'm not showing up as me? Cause that's what's lacking. I've got all the other stuff. My basket is full. Um, and so when I looked at that, I looked at times in my life where I felt the most connected to myself, where I felt the most whole, where I felt the most self care and love. 
Um, and candidly, you know, I went back to times when I was at university where I was using psilocybin on my own on a Tuesday in my room listening to music, not at a party, not, you know, at the beach, stumbling around with your friends, having a giggle. And, and through no great wisdom of my own, it was just how I found a way to connect with myself um, in the quiet depths of who I knew I could be if I was willing to show up as that person, you know, right. Afraid. And so and it's thankfully scary. it's yeah. scary, isn't it? Like, it's scary. Oh like, well, if I'm just, if I can just show everyone who I, that's what one of the, you know, one of the through lines I think of, of my life and, and my work is to allow people to have or give to enable women to give themselves the permission to actually mm. show up in this world as who they are, not what people have told them they need to be. Oh God, it's, it's, you know, I used to kind of, I'm going to say some not politically correct things today and some things that may, you know, defame myself a little bit, but uh, you know, I used to kind of look down my nose a little bit at this idea of like showing up as your whole self and when I was like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Yeah, what, what the uh, fuck does that mean? A bit. I was <laughs> Quantify like, that for me. <laughs> I've got some shit to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. You be your whole self or whatever. And uh, <laughs> now I laugh at myself, laughing right. at myself. Like what right. a joke that I couldn't um, de-ego enough to be okay with the feminine energy piece this kind of like, this kind of cohabitation of vulnerability and power in a way that's welcoming and warm and not dismissive and not, um, not in this sense of kind of, if, if there's only so much I have to get mine, but more in this sense of we can all create more. Um, which in a former self, I would have been like, okay, sure. That doesn't, that the math on that doesn't work, honey. But what I've come to realize is that in effect, um, you know, the only person that was losing out all of those years as I was building businesses and careers and notoriety and collecting, you know, golden tickets uh, was me and the people who are around me most because I was, you know, although I was killing it, I really could have done it bigger, better, faster in a more wholesome way that I felt great about, as opposed to this like struggle of feeling like I had the world on my shoulders all the time. Um, and so the kind of the turning point moment for me was like all these great moments of breakdown and breakthrough. Uh, I just felt like I could keep doing this, but for what? And so I thought, let's just try it. Let's just try the other way because it used to work and it used to be, but so many things come in the way of that. So now I'm a mother of three children who's going to go and do drugs. What? That's nuts. Right. Uh, <laughs> and there's a judgment, right? The judgment, right? even before the thought comes out, you're already judging it. Yeah. Huge, huge yeah. judgment. And what yeah. are people going to say and all the things and like, how am I going to bring this up with my husband? Like you insert thing here. Right. Huge family history of, um, you know, addiction and, 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 and all sorts of things that could cause me to think this is a terrible idea. But really, I looked around it and started doing the research. It just, for me, it comes down to science. So I have, I have one real big asset. It's my brain. And, uh, you know, I don't have a bod. I don't have, you know, a lot of other things that I were formerly amazing assets. Now I'm, and now I'm in the, I have a healthy functioning machine as my asset. Um, but my brain really is my number one asset. So I don't want to mess it up. So I just, you know, I hit the science. And so started finding these brave and courageous people who have continued to do the scientific research on psychedelic medicine for years at, at, at great risk to their own, you know, um, medical degrees and their own reputations because psychedelics were, you know, like I judged them kind of for fringy type woo-woo folks who, you know, did that stuff in college. 
Right. It's for the people in Encinita. Yeah. For right. The people, people on do, all, all my love to people in the Encinitas area. I love but, but it's yeah, yeah, it's for the it's for the it's for those folks who are just like chilling out. But as it turns out, the opposite is true, like many of our assumptions. Um and so I looked at what what could be, you know, I think a lot of people look at what could the downside be. I looked to some of my friends and colleagues who had explored this path and said, you know, the downside is what's happening right now, not exploring what the potential could be. And so I started psychedelic assisted therapy, I would say about three years ago, three and a smidge. And, you know, I went in there with all this bravado because I was like, oh yeah, I do mushrooms. I did this, you know, <laughs> in college. I'm so, I got this. And so, uh, yeah, it's different. Just for anyone who's listening, we're not talking about the same thing at all. Um, we're talking about, even when I was doing it on my own, you know, on a Tuesday, different environment when it's medically assisted and, and it's the set and the setting are really, everything is highly intentional and controlled. And, um, and I can remember them saying, okay, well, when you kind of start to feel something coming on, you just, you know, raise your hand. Okay, that seems fine. And so we'll, I'm sure we'll describe what this is like for people. So maybe we'll go into that now. Are you okay with me talking about my first experience with psychedelic assisted therapy? Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I, I arrived and they gave me this little cup with some, with some different colored, you know, capsules in them. So I meant to take these first two and then Do you know what you were years. taking? What were you taking? No. You know what? Oh, you I didn't, didn't even ask. I was just like, you know what? These people know what they're doing. Mm. I, I, in my, in my life's history, I've taken a lot of things that I'm sure were more detrimental than anything anyone in a medical clinic would give to a human being. So I was like, I'm sure I can trust these folks. And I also didn't want to presuppose. I didn't want to kind of cast forward these assumptions and create a, what I was, what was going to happen any more than I already thought it was going to be fine because I'd, I'd experienced um, psychedelic mushrooms before. And so then I take that what I know to be the mushrooms because they're the color of it and they're ground up in capsules because I'm so I'm like, all right, I, I got you friend. But I can't tell how much it all is and that's fine. And then about half an hour later, nothing's really seeming to happen. And I'm and I'm kind of feeling like the same as you do when you go for surgery or something and they give you and they say count backwards from 10. And I'm always like, I'm going to make it to one. Watch me. Like, this isn't going <laughs> to touch me. And I get to about eight and I'm going to do it French as well just to show you guys <laughs> watch this and yeah. so uh yeah and so I'm like all right it's been half an hour it should all be happening and and so and I close my eyes like just kind of a long blink and in that period of time I realize it's happening and I start seeing uh you know if you just have you ever seen a snowflake under a magnifying glass mm -hmm. yeah so just like that but maybe 50 of them and they're and they start out in black and white and they're beautiful and they're and they're kind of moving and everything seems fine and nothing particularly is it's just it's like watching a movie it's like well that's interesting all right and then you know and then they become colorful and that's interesting too that's fine nothing's really happening and they encourage me to audio tape so i have a i have my phone beside me and it's taping recording and, uh, and so for about four and a half hours, um, of which in the moment I was there, but in hindsight, couldn't have told you anything about it. It's kind of one of those, like, you're there, but you're not there type of a moment. But in the moment, I was very aware and quite capable of anything. If you'd said, Kelsey, take off your mask, they put a little mask on. So you're not, uh, if you open your eyes, you'd see the back of a mask. And they're and I'm listening to music. And at any point, like I did at one point have to go to the washroom. I got up, went and had a pee, everything was normal. Like it, you know, I was quite capable. But then uh, they encourage you after the session to listen to the recording. And I just sat there and I just sobbed like a child. Because after the session. After the session, mm -hmm. um and during the session, you know, some things came up, but again, it was kind of like watching a movie. 
like witnessing something as a third party, like some challenging things, some glorious, beautiful things. Um, but I was very capable of handling all of it. And it wasn't until after when I'm listening to myself recounting some really challenging uh, moments in my life from, from a place of just grace and acceptance and witnessing as opposed to judging um, that I was able to understand forgiveness for some things. And I was able to also embody some of my, some of my gifts, like really, I am amazing at a few things that I never would have given myself the, uh, afforded myself the permission to use your words. Yes. Um, and so that, you know, and then I, I'm thinking, wow. Uh, so that was basically five hours of my life. And I've spent the last 15 years <laughs> just being, uh, having notoriously high expectations of myself and everyone around me. Um, and, and how kind of, how it, in that short period of time, I was able to identify some opportunities for change. And I, I want to make one thing super clear to the people who are listening, which is this idea that I think people think that psychedelic assisted therapy is like the, the silver bullet. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to spend five hours, I'm going to walk out, and I'm going to feel amazing and, the, and problem solved. And I, and I would like to caution that um, most of the work, like most of the, the, the stuff that sticks, that gets deep roots into like our, our transformation as, as individuals is what happens with what you saw or learned or understood. So you can come out and feel amazing and clear and all that, but if you don't have the tough conversation with the person, if you don't then choose to allow those permissions of belief to be who you show up as, if you, you know, if you don't allow that stuff to, as we in this work call integrate, so the integration period to be a part of the work, um, you'll lose it. It's like anything, you know, over time it will fade if you keep uh, showing up doing all the same behaviors. If you didn't allow the lessons you got to witness to really settle in. Um, and, and I, and, and I came out of it thinking, huh, well, that was entirely different than what I've experienced. That was entirely different than what I assumed. And I'm in a position to be a person that people might look at and say, well, if she's going to try that, maybe it's not so out there and crazy. Maybe if the 44 year old mother of three pretty typical person is willing to research, look at the science, do the work, um, and, and willing to stand out and say, hey, I'm here. I'm so excited to announce I'm the CEO of this company that people will go, oh, it's not what I thought. Um, and I believe that that's kind of, you know, that's my next great work on this planet in addition to shepherding three human lives is this idea of, of being, being a person who is open and willing to admit that life has not been easy for me, you know, um, and despite the Google ability, even people could go, oh, it's so great. It's, there have been some rough patches and I've been weak, um, but I am so grateful for the opportunity to do this work in a way that allows us the scientific backbone, the real rigorous research, the real kind of data that people can stand on and feel confident and comfortable in. And, uh, and just to be my small part in what's a much bigger thing that's moving through at the moment, um, which is uh, I think people's willingness to and want, really, I think just people's want 
to like you said at the beginning allow themselves to show up fully as who they are because this is a quick spin on the blue marble you know when you get when you get through a few things you go wow uh if i have one shot at this thing i might as well take it right. and so that that was my that was my jumping off point it was really that feeling of if i'm not going to show up for myself then who is so it's been a, a beautiful journey and it's been a great honor to be uh, afforded the opportunity not only to do the work but now to be a shepherd of it what i find interesting when i listen to your story is for someone who has achieved so much and maybe lived in her masculine for you to come into this first session and not know what you were taking. I mean, that is, that is the feminine, like even before you were there, like it was ever present in you, right? You always had it. It's just the voice wasn't necessarily as loud or as a, you weren't as attuned to that voice or that signal as maybe you were living in, in your masculine. And we can talk, we'll talk about some of the different um, medically assisted uh, psychedelics in a moment. Sure. Um, you mentioned set and setting, you mentioned integration. And mm -hmm. when we think about psychedelics, one, you know, and, and there's certain classes of them, uh, MDMA being one of them, um, they are very much empathogens where they allow for, you know, and you were describing it, like I had so much more understanding and forgiveness you know, of the things that made, or I was able to see things from a different perspective, instead of being mm -hmm. like the first person player, I was mm -hmm. now looking at it from this third party perspective. And you're able to understand, you know, if it was someone who did something to you, you can understand maybe the driving factors in their life that created their, that drove their beliefs, which then drove their um, behavior. So my, I guess my question in all of this is post that first treatment. And I agree. And I agree 100% with you when you say that the integration is, is it, that's where the juicy stuff is, because mm -hmm. you can have this sort of squeak, this like squeak through the door, this glimpse through that um, therapy session. But if you don't actually do some of the, like take some of the initiative to walk through the door, mm -hmm. then it's always just going to be this acute realization. And then it fades this acute realization. And then it fades. And that might be my judgy. That might be my judgment there. <laughs> I have been told. No, that I totally agree. I think you're, I think you're bang on. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the things that changed for you post intervention? And then maybe some of the, some of the integration or the integrative tools that helped you to take the story or take the knowing and the experience from your, from your session into your everyday present life. Yeah. Great. So I would say the, the very first one came, um, I always had this sense that if I, I just had this, this sense, I can feel it in my body right now, even as I'm starting to speak about it, of winning, like winning is, is, I'm just, I'm bloodthirsty for it. I salivate, my hands get sweaty. I'm, I can feel my pupils dilating, things get brighter. I You're just, like a huntress. <laughs> I'm just ready to kill. I yeah. absolutely am. And whatever, however I showed up on this planet, um, that was a part of, that was a part of what I got. It was one of the cards in my deck. And I, and it was a card I love playing because it worked great. And this particular time in humanity on this planet, in this society, loves the, loves the winner. And part of my experience in that first session was this kind of uh, in scene where there's a, like a Viking. And this Viking is male, but I can kind of tell it's reflecting me. You know, it's one of those stories where it, even when you watch a movie and you kind of, you, you can tell what the you story is. You see yourself in the character. You see yourself in a character or you know where it's going. You know what the lesson is about to be. And I'm like, oh yeah, gee, this guy's vicious for sure. And he goes out and he, and he kills a bunch of folk and he wins and he saves this town. And there's all these women and children on the shore and he's protected them and he's done all this good work. And, and then, and then the scene goes on and then, and then at night, he's by himself and he's crying. And for me, just watching that, and I get a little emotional talking about it because it was, that was my life. I was doing the winning 
and it feels so good when you're winning, but then when it's all over and you've, you've kind of done what you thought you were meant to do, but you're still alone. A pretty shallow, hollow moment. Uh, and then I kind of have a laugh, you know, this like, you imagine like the Buddha, you know, the big fat Buddha that's laughing that you see at stores painted golden. Then I have this laugh that's like that, which is just like, oh my goodness, child, thank you for learning this ridiculous human lesson. Like you, all of this, all of this winning, when all of those people on shore were there all along, and maybe they didn't need a protector. Maybe they just needed you to be there. You didn't have to go off and shine and show and win. Uh, maybe you created the war. And so for me, the integration that came out of that whole witnessing of the storyline was, oh my goodness, how many wars in my life have I created? Right. Like lots of wars. I love war because I get to win it. You see. And there's strategy <laughs> and there's- Right? Yeah. Or even building businesses. Like right. why always bigger? Why always bigger? I don't even know. I can't even say because it just feels like winning. <laughs> like, it's insane. I never had a real clear sense of what I wanted. I had a real clear sense of what I should do, which was win. And so my integration of that, watching that part of my own movie was to come back to my life and say, okay, great. What about this gets real deliberate? What wars do I want to fight? What am I willing to actually fight for? My children? Absolutely. My health? 100%. My relationships? My family? Yes. Is there a way I can do that without having to bear arms? Is there a way that I can do that in a feminine light? Is there a way that I can be the creator from the shore instead of having to like cast away and keep all of these people away from me always? You know, and so for me, it was, you know, to, to, to speak to integration, it was, it was seeing the movie, it was recognizing my part in the movie, it was coming back into my life and saying, what about this can I apply directly? And then it was showing up every day and doing it, which meant some tough conversations, you know, which meant some stories, which meant some I forgive you's also. Um, and which meant some changes, one of which was looking at my life, having built my businesses and saying, I don't think my heart's in this particular career anymore. You know, some big stuff out of like probably four minutes, <laughs> four minute movie in right. the first session right. uh, changed a lot. But, um, you know, every step of the way, though, it just it, it felt even when it was hard, it was right. Even when it was hard, it was right. And how do you, how do you harness the feminine now? So I, in our preamble, and then just, you know, in, in speaking to you and you sharing some of your successes, you know, I, I, you know, the masculine, <laughs> maybe the toxic masculine in me, you know, I can see when someone is really driven and when they've relied on their masculine. Mm -hmm. And I think that Betty's that are listening to this, a lot of them I attract, I attract my kind. So there's lots yeah, of type cool. A personalities, right? And that listen to the pod. Uh, lots of clinicians listen to the pod as well. So this is really helpful for them in terms of counseling um, their patients. And when we talk about the feminine, it's 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 hard to it's hard to quantify. I have found it hard to give words to the feminine because it's mm. just about it's and the way that I describe it is you just like the to-do lists, like the not to-do list becomes more important than the to-do list, the mm. presence and the focus, you know, the, the right now, not thinking about what you have to do or what happened or what the strategy is, what the, what the mind maze is going to be, how you're going to get there. It's just about being here right now and mm. surrendering to the unknown. And I think that that is so, it's a difficult pill to swallow 
pun intended, if you haven't done psychedelic therapy before, because it just seems like this intangible, you know, you said before, like when someone was like, yeah, I just want to be whole. You're like, okay, go and do that. Like, you know, <laughs> loser, like I, I'm, I'll be over here with the math and the algorithms figure, keeping the fort down so you can right. go and find yourself, you know? So I, how, how do you, how do you explain the marrying uh, or the integration of more of being more feminine uh, mm. or, or that what I, you know, the, not just what I call, but the divine feminine, like, how do you marry that with a woman who has grown up in a very patriarchal, like we've all grown up in this very much patriarchal yeah. world order where the accolades, the success, the money, the construction companies, all the mm. things, those are all celebrated, but the, you know, sitting, you know, meditating, I mean, maybe you can gamify it if you have like a muse headband or something, but like the, 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 the present moment, um, and surrendering to the unknown is, is much harder to quantify for people. So in, mm. in your words, in your experience, in your knowing, how does the feminine show up for you? Yeah. So I think what's been, again, is a bit of a laugh. I love my own, my own, like <laughs> ridiculous sense of self and superiority sometimes in that masculine sense. And when I look back at myself, I, I recognize that the way that I, I achieved all this masculine kind of accolade and brilliance was actually entirely feminine all along. So the creator in me, the creative kind of person who has always loved the unknown actually thrives best in the, in the let's just witness it. Let's just allow it to unfold let's create the relationships that afford it the best opportunity for life has always been how I built everything through partnerships, relationships, having vision, not relying on the algorithm that's telling me what to do next, but questioning it. And then I kind of looked at that and went, okay, there, it's always been there. It's actually been my, you know, when people say like, how did you do it? What's your special something? And then I go, oh, yeah. actually, it was just that. It was just, it was just this kind of what we call the feminine, which you know, I, I I still do if I'm if I'm totally honest, struggle with the the naming of it, because I actually feel a bit more like it's neither masculine nor feminine. It's um, the way, the way that I feel into it is um, it's just the balanced force. So the feminine to me can be just equally as vicious. Yes. Like if you look at the species, it can be every profane. species, yes, yes. The, the female of the species is the most venomous, the most deadly. Yes. She's the hunter. And I guarantee you, like if it was my husband v me to feed our children, I would probably kill and maim in just such a much more vicious way than he ever would. So I think there is this duality that I, that has been a, a little bit, no one likes to admit the viciousness. Um, so, so I actually like to just apply it as the balanced force because the feminine is such an active and important part of that. And the masculine can also hold steady. So it's the creator who understands balance. To me, that is kind of where I like to operate, but it's allowing the creator to have merit and not to hide her and not to say, well, because there isn't stats that support the knowing, because there is, you know, all of this intuitive sense of creation, it doesn't come with, uh, it doesn't come with the rock we can stand on. It only comes with the proof we afford it by living into it. And so, you know, I think, I think that's what we're witnessing more now through leadership and feminine leadership, if we call it that, is more of an opportunity for those things to be afforded the light. So people can go, oh yeah, that, that does work. It's not woo, it's not, oh yeah, okay, whatever, just go, but you know, find your best self. Um, it works out really well. And it's the reason why we see, you know, 
20% higher return on companies run by women in the public markets. When we see leadership through COVID and the countries run by women doing so much better than the countries run by men. And this is not like a down with men thing. It's not at all. Oh, but you can be a male and completely tapped into your masculine and your feminine. Precisely. It's yes. the balance of the two yes. that I think allows um, a new form of leadership. And, I, and, it, and you know what, and in fairness, I'm not so sure it's new. It's just there's, being, there's space being made for it at the level that people are able to see now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and I think I agree with you when you, I mean, there, there, everything is like an oscillating scale, right? So you can yeah. have the masculine, which is the protector, the doer, and then you can move into like the profane or the toxic yes. version of that, where it's like overbearing and controlling and overly aggressive. And the same with the feminine, you can have the nurturing and the surrender and the unknown, and then you can get into like passive aggressiveness and yeah. whining and all. So there's, you know, you can you move go too far. On, yeah. You can go too far <laughs> on either of them. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about mind cure and let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the, um, the different types of psychedelic assisted therapy that you are doing in, um, uh, in, in mind cure, maybe sure. first how, how the opportunity came about and, um, and then we can talk about some of the different, uh, the different verticals in there as well. Great. So I'm going to give folks a quick uh, 101 on Canada versus the States and what can be done where, because I'm sure your listeners are all over. Yes. Uh, so in the United States, as it stands at the moment, psychedelic assisted therapy with anything other than ketamine is illegal. So not legal. And then there is a, a small caveat around um, people who will say, but they just legalized things in Oregon or DC. And, and in effect, actually, they decriminalized it. And there's a difference. And it's important to the listener because I don't want anyone to go out and buy a bag of mushrooms right. and then get pulled over and think, oh, well, Kelsey Ramsden said this is going to be right. fine. <laughs> um, what it means is it's, it's still illegal. It's just they're not practicing uh, to the same degree, putting people in jail for having those medicines. It's still schedule okay. one. It's still schedule one. So yeah, let's which all be clear on that. And what that means is in the States that there's no medical, they currently, there's no medical use for right. these substances. Yeah. And, and then we can get into a huge conversation about why it shouldn't be schedule one. And schedule one, in fact, is also uh, afforded the, the, the grand um, nature of being drugs that have no medical use are highly addictive and actually um, harmful, which we know to not be necessarily true, but you know, therein lies politics and all sorts of other things that we won't, we'll save for another time. Yes. I'm, I want Rick Doblin on the podcast. That's oh, what I want. Yeah. He, he's so well, you know, it, 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 I'll tell, I'll give you a list of resources after people could listen and get into all the old, all the heavy deets, but yeah. But so in America, uh, in, in, in the United States of America, that's, that's how things are sitting at the moment. So you can go for a ketamine assisted therapy session totally legally, and that's all in bounds. If you're going uh, in Canada, ketamine is legal. Psilocybin is legal only with something called the Section 56 exemption. And what that is, is the government of Canada is saying, we recognize there probably is some value here in these medicines. We don't have a system or a framework or a structure right now to allow them to be prescribed. We just don't have enough scientific backbone to, to say yes yet. What they're defining as enough. Right. Yes. Precisely. And, yes. but, but we're willing to give it a try because we see some merit. And so those exemptions have been given up until this point predominantly to cancer patients who are palliative and palliative care. Um, and just in August, Theracil did the first treatment. It was revolutionary. It's amazing. We can look at Thomas. He's from Saskatchewan. And he's in his early 60s, I think. And he was the first candidate uh, to undergo psilocybin-assisted therapy in Canada. So it's early days, but it's moving very, very quickly. So there will be news announced in the next day or so at the time of this taping that another group within Canada was given another 56 exemption. There were just 17 exemptions given to therapists so that they can experience the work so that they can be better afforded to do the treatment. And so with mind cure and the therapy that we'll be providing will also be under 56 exemption through our clinic uh, or health center in Kelowna, but will be coupled with uh, ketamine 
and will be researched. So all of our work that will be done in the Kelowna location will be through some form of research. We think that doing any form of work within psychedelic assisted therapy at the moment that doesn't have research in behind it is not advancing the medicine in the way that we think is responsible. Um, because there is so much work to be done. There is so much work that has been done. And I think the sooner we can bring these medicines, the, the volume of scientific rigor that, that the governments want to see, the better we'll all be. So everything we're gonna do is gonna be based on research so that we can um, advance the acceptance of the medicine. So in Kelowna, it'll be psilocybin mixed with ketamine, some psilocybin on its own. Uh, it really is kind of patient dependent. And then um, we'll be doing some work in lab uh, on neuroregeneration. So looking at how we can actually regenerate and recover from traumatic head uh, injuries, um, from spinal cord injury, from stroke, from concussive uh, situations. And so, the, you know, most of our work will be around um, regen regeneration and bringing people what I call kind of back to wholesome or fulsome life. And, uh, and as a byproduct, if you happen to have suffered from anxiety or happen to not be feeling your best, um, you'll be, I think, quite happy about it. Let's, let's define ketamine and psilocybin. So psilocybin, mm -hmm. um, let, let's start with psilocybin and then we can, we sure. can talk about ketamine for someone who hasn't heard those, those terms yeah, before. Great. So psilocybin, uh, and there are a variety of of types of psilocybin, but in, you know, in the common nomenclature, we would call those magic mushrooms. And there is a, a world of magic mushrooms out there, so many varieties. Um, and so it's kind of like talking about alcohol. So there's, if there was just alcohol, there wouldn't be a liquor store. <laughs> so psilocybin, there's a whole variety of strains and species. Um, so we are speaking at kind of that 30,000 foot level, but psilocybin is, uh, comes in basically two forms. So one is the naturally occurring. So it's a mushroom that's harvested and dried. And then the other kind is synthesized. So that's created in a lab. And there's a variety of conversation around what, if one is better than the other, but when it comes to medical applicability, it's important that every dose of any medicine that's studied is exactly the same as the last. So that you could never disprove some science by saying, well, you know, that one wasn't consistent or you're always driving for consistency. So there is some benefit to the synthesized psilocybin for research. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about psilocybin. Um, and then on the ketamine side of things, most people, if they've broken their arm or gone in for some form of surgery, uh, will have been administered ketamine. So it's an anesthetic that they utilize in the hospital or uh, in some outpatient settings. And um, I won't go get into dosage levels, but at lower doses, uh, people are given the opportunity to depart from their ego for a little while. So it's less psychedelic in that you're, you're less likely to see the snowflakes that I got to see, um, but, but often likely to not, um, to not have your ego with you. It's also, I think, important for listeners to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about ego. I think this is something that we take for granted when we have these conversations with people who um, have been working with psychedelic medicine for some time. So are you, are you okay if we just do a quick riff on Absolutely. ego? Absolutely. Yes, let's, let's riff. Let's riff on ego. So when we hear the word ego, a lot of times we think, oh, I don't have an ego, you know. I'm, which is your ego talking, which is your ego. <laughs> it's like very meta, yes. um, you know, I'm chill. I don't have an ego, but really your ego is your sense of self, the big I, the Kelsey Ramsden who exists, right? She is an ego, a belief of self that is independent of other. Yeah. That's my ego. It's good. It serves me really well. I like, I like knowing who I am as a person on the planet and identifying as Kelsey Ramsden. Good ego. Um, so there is this sense of self that is also um, a defensive self. So it's important to protect Kelsey Ramsden as Kelsey Ramsden. So uh, my ego likes to judge things and my ego likes to run from things. And my ego likes to attack things because my ego's drive is to survive and have a belief structure that's important to me. 
And again, none of that is negative. All of that is held in a positive light. That's why we exist as humans is to, you know, not why, but it's a large part of how we exist as humans is to have a sense of uh, providing for and protecting self so that I survive and thrive. So it's great to have an ego. The benefit of dissolving the ego though is in allowing the defenselessness. So it's quite possible that without having to protect myself all the time or defend myself or judge myself or judge others or you know this whole matrix and the web that is required of the ego, um, it allows us to, to bear a position that we often call the witness. And so the way that I like to explain this to people is, um, let's just say you're an individual and you're standing on a street corner and you're looking across the street. There's two ways to explain what you see. One is, I saw a boy, he looked pretty sketchy. He was wearing a red hoodie and the hood was pulled up over his face so you couldn't really tell who he was. And he was riding his bike really quickly and he dodged into that building to avert from something. Or I saw a young boy riding a bicycle with a red hoodie on, he went into that building. Same story, one has a lot of judgment. One is a witness. So some, just some facts of things I saw or a whole lot of narrative around it to ensure that you get the message I want you to get. And so this is kind of the sense of ego. And so when we're talking about ego in this work is, I can witness the world through my ego or I can witness the world as a witness which is the small eye, the eye that doesn't have to defend or prove or assure or feel anything other than present, like you were talking about, just being here now, the small eye. And so ketamine allows the big eye to just like take a breather on the bench for a minute. Don't worry, you're not out of the game. You'll be, you'll be right back. Um, but, just, but just to hold on, we're cool, you know, um, we're safe. And, and there's potential for learning and understanding that maybe we're not afforded when you're always present with the big eye. There are some things you're just not able to see the same way. Um, or it allows yeah. you to look at things through a different story because the ego yes. is a big filter. If you're always looking at it through a particular, let's, let's say it's a victim, you know, like the red hoodie he was running yeah. from, or, you know, you have this victim story or this victim yeah. through line versus uh, something more neutral. Neutral. Mm -hmm. And maybe he still is a villain. I don't know yet, mm -hmm. but there's more information to be garnered when we witness. And the great thing about the witness is we can see ourselves. And so the, you know, I think I, I love the old, like, you know, three in the morning, staring at the ce ceiling self that is pretty tough to fool. And that's, you know, that's that self that goes, that was the self that was in, in my world, um, unfulfilled, still kind of searching, knowing there was more of me that I wasn't allowing to show up, knowing there was parts of me that my children never got to see. And that was the part of self that, you know, come the morning, the big eye would show up and protect her. Right. Never let her get out, you know, because that could cause a lot of change and a lot of tough conversations and all of that. And so for me, the big eye was important to keep around, you know, until I realized the big eye was doing more harm. Right. I, I think that's so great. And one of the things that I love about it being medically assisted is what we know is the ego, when we think about it in a neurological sense, uh, some have suggested, and there's quite a bit of evidence to, um, uh, to support that this is a neurological system called the default mode network. So when you temporarily just quiet this default mode network, you, you become much more vulnerable. And this is, you know, um, why maybe doing this in a medically assisted setting is incredibly important because you, all of your defenses are down. You are, it is, it is a, it, you're highly suggest, like you are in a highly suggestible state. Um, yeah. And this is why I love the idea of there, you know, in, in my experiences, there have been sitters who sat because you are, you can just do, you can, you know, you can do some dumbass things if you're not, if you don't have someone kind of holding space for you, or you can come to some crazy conclusions if you don't have someone holding space for you and allowing um, 
uh, or not directing because you don't want people to sort of direct your experience, but um, uh, what, how do I want to say it? Not, protect is not the right word either, but you, you like know when you were, you know, when you were a child and hopefully you had a, someone around you who took care of you when you were sick. Yeah. And they, and they, and they just said, okay, I've got the ginger ale. It's getting flat on the counter. Yeah. I've got the, you know, the soup's this. on the stove. I've got the soup. It's here. Yeah. When you're ready, I will bring it. Yeah. It's that fee- for me, it's that feeling like no one's yeah. pushing anything on me. No one's doing right. it, but they're just, it's all fine and out there and ready for when I am. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this last session that I did, for me, up until that point, all of them, even when they were hard, they were good. Mm-hmm. But this last one was a doozy. It was it was not the good time I was looking forward to. I, you know, I wanted to go in and come out the other side, and I thought everything was going to be great, and and um, and it it was great, but it was the hardest one I've done. And in those moments, having the person who's just there and ready. So when I, you know, when I lift up my mask and I go, I just need, I just need a minute. This is hard. I'm seeing some stuff that's hard. They go, right. Okay. And then I'm back in and I'm, you know, because I know it's safe out there. What I'm seeing is not happening. I'm just being afforded the opportunity to look at it from a different perspective. And so I, I feel capable of doing it in a way um, that I, that I, you know, I never really felt before. It's all, it's also like if you're a, this is kind of a trite example, but if you're the kind of, I like to have a bath. I'm a, I'm a bath person. And for a long time, I lived in a house where the, the door to the bathroom was um, like a pocket door. So it didn't have a lock that really and even though I knew no one was really coming, I just never really totally chilled out in the bath. I was just waiting for a child to come running in with the next and latest emergency. Uh, but now my bathroom has a lock on the door. And, and it's equal likelihood someone's going to come and knock. But for some reason, that little is enough for me to be able to settle in and go, okay, I can relax. Right. And uh, when you work with people who are well-trained and who understand these medicines and who understand the power of them and the great honor and responsibility it is to sit with someone who is, who is willing to do the work to, to, to witness their whole self and to bring that person into the world um, and to really show up for themselves in that way is a great honor. And, you know, to me, they're that little lock. And then, and then you can, you can really get to work. What about um, someone who might be listening here might say, you know, this sounds really great. Mm. I don't know if I'm quite ready for this experience yet. Is there, um, is there a place for microdosing? Is there a place for, um, yeah. Is there, is there a place for microdosing? So this, there's a variety of, of perspectives on microdosing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the devil's advocate and sit on both sides of the fence on this one. So microdosing is not legal. So let's start with that. Okay. Um, there's no schedules, no exemptions for them. There's no exemptions for the microdose. Uh, that notwithstanding, I know lots of folks who microdose, lots of upstanding citizens. It's a very real thing in our society. It's happening often. Um, so that, that being said, there's, there's a challenge because it's not something that was traditionally researched. So when we look at the research settings, most of the research that's been done around psychedelics has been done in a university type setting or medically kind of this, this large dose type of research. So, so there isn't a lot to stand on. However, there's a lot of experience. So experientially, I speak with a lot of people who say tremendously helped me focus, brings me into my body, makes me feel grounded, um, helps me feel clear. I can move through difficult decisions with more ease. Like there's a variety of 
experiences, very many of which are quite similar, which leads me to believe that there's something there. Um, now, on the other side of things, there are some folks who say, well, microdosing doesn't do much more than the placebo effect when we look at the numbers. I have always been a bit of the opinion, which is if it's working, great. So I'm okay even with, with the even fact. with placebo, if the right? placebo is working or even the nocebo right. effect, it's like the most consistent result you'll ever get across the board in medicine and literature is the placebo effect running right? in at about 30% constantly all the time. Precisely. Yeah. So yeah. if that's what's happening, great. If it's something more, which personally, I think it is based on all of the conversations and the people who've, there are, there are democratized research projects that have gone on in the past couple of years that are showing high rates of efficacy around microdosing. Now, part of the problem with the microdose, and this is for everyone who's listening who might think they might want to consider maybe possibly doing this kind of thing. There's a variety of protocols. So some people microdose every single day. Some people do four days on, four days off. Some people do once every four days. Some, but, you know, so there's a whole lot of there. So when we talk about it, it's kind of, again, a bit of a muddy thing because there hasn't been a real, here's the way. There's no standardization. Yeah. Not, not yet, yeah. not yet. And, that, and it's coming, I believe it is coming. Um, but, you know, I think, I think like anything. So I think about mental wellness on, uh, on a spectrum. So you think about in your car, you have a speedometer. So all the way over here, when we're going, say, 10 miles or kilometers an hour, we can, we can look at things like nootropics or uh, adaptogens or things that just support cognitive function, mental function, neck up supports. The same way you take your vitamin C and D and every other given thing for neck down. That's how we think about it anyway, but we know it's everywhere. Um, this idea of supporting the neck up. It's an amazing thing. It's like mental hygiene. Imagine you treated your brain just like you brush your teeth every day. You did something good. Like what? My dream. That's my dream. Right? That's what we're doing. Yeah. Of I love course. Yep. And so this is over here and it doesn't have to be anything other than legal, legal, totally legal gear. Then as we advance up and we're going, you know, maybe halfway up, we're going say 60 miles an hour. Then we're talking about things like microdosing. Then we're talking about something that's not it's sub perceptive in that you're not seeing snowflakes. We're not in snowflake zone. We are still in the, it just feels like I had a great cup of coffee. Like this is perfect. It's just getting me right to where I need to be. And then we can keep going and we can go into some like higher level dosing that's still, you're still operational. And then we can go to flood dosing, which is what I was talking about earlier, where you're really, you know, definitely should not be behind any kind of wheel um, in any way, shape or form. So I just invite everyone to think about mental wellness on that spectrum as well, that there is everyday mental wellness is a thing. We don't have to get to the interventionist place of being all the way on the other end of the spectrum to start considering, are there ways that I can adapt what I consume through my eyes, ears, mouth, nose, mind, physical body? We're consuming all the time, a whole lot of things. What we choose to consume and part of that can be, you know, introducing the notion of microdosing or even, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're really on the fence and you're going just something, what about, what about a nootropic like uh, chaga mushroom or lion's mane or, you know, other natural products that are supportive to the old neck up paradigm. Right. And I, I always find it interesting when we, when we think about mushrooms, uh, psilocybin and, you know, lion's mane and mm -hmm. reishi mushrooms, et cetera. It's always fascinated me that these things have, uh, that we have receptors in the brain for them. You know, it's not like, it, it, I mean, it, and you just think about this just purely mechanistically, right? If there yeah. wasn't use for them, in this way, would we have, like, we don't have receptor. Well, I mean, you know, you need to be drinking water to stay hydrated, but you don't have, hopefully you don't have a psychedelic experience every time you drink water, right. Or you consume whatever beverage, but mushrooms, there is a, we have the receptors for them mm -hmm. uh, in the central, I should say, not just in the brain, in the central nervous system. Yes. Um, so it's interesting to me when you have developed as humans have developed alongside, mm -hmm. uh, 
fungi or fungi, mm-hmm. um, that there is some synergistic, there's something there. I mean, there's something there. And we're starting to see as you, uh, you know, as your group is starting to do and what we've seen in the literature, that there is quite a bit of evidence to support the PTSD, like the camp of like this, you know, this treatment resistant uh, depression, uh, PTSD, chronic anxiety, chronic pain, um, Mm -hmm. where we have this overactivation um, of some of these neural centers and these psychedelics allow for a quieting of certain centers and you know, other, other neural networks and other neural centers to flourish. So it's just, I mean, there's, even if you're not, even if I don't have the data and this is, you know, kind of the um, evidence-based trolls, it's like, what, what's the minimum amount of evidence that you are willing to accept as evidence? Because a case study, yes, it's not an RCT. It's not a double random, you know, not double randomized or whatever. It is still evidence. It is still evidence. And when you have not just one, it's not an N of one, but you have case study after case study after case study, Mm. but warrants further investigation perhaps into some of these, you know, more gold standard type of, uh, you know, um, inquiries. Well, and I think that's, that's why I'm so excited. Isn't it just great when sometimes things line up, you know, I, for years I was like, uh, I don't really, you know, I did all these things and I don't really know what, what's my purpose going to be. And I had this inkling about psychedelics as a thing. It was kind of like the joke around like that was Kelsey's Kelsey was their highest best self when she was taking mushrooms and, and all this. And then, and then just as the world happens to be, uh, people are opening themselves up to being science driven and less around stigmatizing the notion of something because you know, someone in college went and they did do something stupid. Absolutely. But right. they weren't utilizing it the right way. I mean, you can use a, a steak knife in a stupid way, but it's okay for us to all eat steak with it. So just the same way as you can use a medicine in a, in a terrible way. Sure. Um, but this idea that right now we're at a point in history where science is winning um, over kind of value-based things that maybe don't have enough merit to hold the science back. Like in an epidemic crisis of mental wellness um, and aging, and with a population that's aging at the rate at with, at with which it is by b- virtue of like, it's, um, it's demographic kind of skew set. The idea of allowing psychedelic medicine to be of service now is perfect. It's just perfect timing. And so I think it's also important to pay a little bit of honor to the people whose shoulders on which we all stand in the same way all science advances based on someone else's research. Uh, And so those of us operating in the psychedelic research space at the moment and offering psychedelic therapy are standing on the history of people who have been utilizing these medicines culturally for years, decades, eons, um, back into, you know, the records of time when things were scratched on the walls of caves. So, you know, I just think it's, a, it's an amazing time to be living where we are afforded the opportunity to do this research um, and to, as you say, look at the effectiveness in, in a way that allows us to really heal a lot of folks who are suffering dearly yes. for such a variety of reasons. And, um, I mean, I think if you speak with anyone who has utilized any of these medicines in a medical setting, um, it's hard to carry some of the presumptive and assumptive judgments after you've had those conversations. Um, It's just really hard. It's really hard to beat science. I agree. (laughs) I agree. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to just, you know, in wrapping this up, Kelsey, I just want to thank you so much for not only your own experience, but, you know, the honesty and transparency uh, with which you came to today's conversation with and the work that you're doing in the world. I think it's really important, really important. So if, if someone is listening and they're like, you know, this piques my interest, where, Mm -hmm. where can people find, uh, where can people find you? Where can people find MindCure? Yeah, sure. They can find me at Kelsey Ramsden and uh, they can find MindCure at MindCure on all the regular locations, locations and places and spaces. 
uh, mindcure.com is probably the best place to get onboarded with all the greatest and latest information. Yeah, I welcome you. Thank you so much. Dr. Stephen Gundry is the video that's coming up next for you. Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb.